All right. Well, Linda McDonald, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so we are going to talk about this that you've written. You've written a great little book here called How to Help Your Spouse Heal from Your Affair, a compact manual for the unfaithful. Uh, this is an area of our ministry that we are we're intersecting a lot. You know, a lot of couples where there has been unfaithfulness, um, sexual betrayal of some sort in the relationship. And um, you've written a book on that. Uh, quite an interesting book, I think, because sometimes a lot of the uh, a lot of the focus gets really on each of the individual spouses, right? It gets on the betraying spouses, recovery or whatever they need to do, and then on the betrayed spouses healing. I feel like what you've done is is you've you've put these things together in a way that says what can that spouse that has done the betraying do in order to actually help the marriage heal. So tell me why tell us why you wrote this book and maybe how you got to this point to where you wrote this book. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, when I went to school to be a marriage and family therapist, I've always had a special interest in infidelity recovery. The only thing I can explain that with is I grew up with an alcoholic father, and the alcohol felt like the other woman. It just was the thing that competed with my mom and with us as a family. So I think that's where my interest began. And then I was a lay counselor for a few years and then decided I wanted to do it professionally. The reason I wrote the book is in working with couples struggling with recovering from infidelity is I would get some people in there that weren't just there to drop their spouse off while they go take off with the other woman or man that really wanted to save their marriages, but they kept doing stupid things that mm. would sabotage the very thing they wanted. And I, and I would try and guide them and help them, but sometimes the, that was way down the road and they kept doing damage without meaning to. They really did want to save their marriages. So I wrote a little article called How to Help Your Spouse Heal from Your Affair and began sharing it with my clients. And then my, th my counseling colleagues began asking me for it and then it just kind of spread. And then I began doing little workshops at conferences and things. I thought it'd be really cool to have a handy little book that I could actually give to people besides just emailing them an email attachment. And so mm -hmm. um, that's, that's when I worked on the book. It took a lot more work than I expected, but I really wanted people to have practical tools. Um, so that's, that's why I wrote it. And well, I think it's, it's been proven helpful. It, you know, people need something little. They don't need this big, deep psychobabble <laughs> expert. Well, here's what I was going to say. I was going to say, listen, as a man, I like the, the width of this book. Yeah. Uh, there's no wasted words in there, you know? Oh, yeah. And it's kind of like, um, I remember the first time that I ever read A.W. Tozer's Knowledge of the Holy, because I'd been seeing it referenced in like every Christian book that I'd ever re read. And I thought, okay, I got to read this book. I was shocked at how small it was, huh. but it was the same kind of thing. It's like, okay, there's no wasted paragraphs, no wasted sentences. And, and I love the way that you just dive right in because right at the very beginning, you say that there's actually five options that an unfaithful partner has after an affair. Can you share with us what those five options are? Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, one of them is to just leave the marriage for the affair partner. Uh, they, uh, that's an option. I, I call it the, mass murder option mm. simply because it causes the most damage of all the options it leaves the kids and the spouse with having to deal with the couple from hell for the rest of their lives if they stay together uh, and it's not necessarily the best option because the chances of an affair turning into a long-term marriage isn't all that high so it's a risk for both the person involved and and the damage and the carnage that goes on for years. It's just an eternal trigger for the rest of the family. Another option is to leave the marriage and the affair partner just to give up. Sometimes it's just because they're afraid it'll be too much work or sometimes it's changed them. I love what Philip Yancey says in What's So Amazing About Grace is that sometimes, yeah, God will forgive, but we don't know. 
if it will change us. And sometimes people, their character, their beliefs uh, end up changing them and they go on to not face the damage and and they, they change as a person. They are not as loving, they're not as aware, they, uh, it's, it's, I call it the murder option. Not mass murder, but it's still murder option. The next one is to stay, stay with the spouse, but do very little to try and repair it. Like, you should just be glad I'm here, that I didn't leave, and they act entitled, and they're lazy. And that just <clears throat> does so much damage to the spouse. It's like, aren't I worth it? Um, how come you're not making an effort? I'm dying over here. And you're acting kind of nonplussed about it. So it's sort of the slow leak thing. It ends up being what I call negligent homicide, just from the neglect. And, uh, a spouse can only handle that for so long without either deteriorating mentally and emotionally or ending up in their marriage. Uh, the next one is to make what I was running into a lot in my practice, and that's a bungled haphazard effort. Uh, to repair, but they're relying on their own judgment. And usually people, when they first get discovered or first confess, they're scrambling. Like if they do want to save the marriage, they're desperate and they're caught up in their own shame. They don't realize the damage they've done. They're just scrambling and they try to do things to try and fix their spouse. Like you should be over this by now, or how come you're still bothered about this? Or, um, you know, staying in touch with the other woman or man just to be quote unquote friends. And they just don't realize that some of their efforts are actually making things worse, even if they want to save the marriage. You know, on that particular option, uh, we see that a lot too. In, in folk, in, you know, we deal primarily with uh, where the husband has been the unfaithful spouse and then the wife is the one that's been betrayed. And so many times those husbands, there's a, there's a good intention yes. in their heart, but in many ways, their mindset is, I'm just trying to put out fires. They're yeah. not necessarily thinking of like, okay, my house has been leveled here and what do I need to do to rebuild it well? Yeah, and I so it's more that. of like, just put out all the fires. And then if all the fires are out, who cares about the rubble? Yeah. And <laughs> it's, a, it's sort of a, a defensive approach rather than saying, well, what would it look like to reconstruct and rebuild? I love that. That's a perfect image. I love that. Um, and then the fifth one is to make a heartfelt, well-advised effort. And that means mm -hmm. you can't do it on your own. You get professional help. You get accountability in your life. You, you, you get advice from people that have either been there or have wisdom beyond your own. You can't be objective with yourself in recovering from something like this. So I call it the character building potential resurrection option. And it gives them- the Yeah, and we're definitely, we're definitely gonna get to that character building part in a little while. But, okay. but you also say in the book that uh, if rebuilding the marriage is to be possible, that the unfaithful spouse has to quote unquote, get it. Yes. Can you help us understand what does that mean? And why is that so important to rebuilding the marriage? Um. When a person first pulls out of an affair, they've been in a, a what I call an affair bubble. Uh, they are not living in reality, so they aren't in tune with the damage yet. It takes a while to, for that to the bubble to completely burst and to really put light on it. And so they tend to minimize the damage that it's caused. They they want to make excuses. They still live with their rationalizations, uh, but they have to call it for what it is. It's it's like in scripture, you know, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us. Well, the word confess literally means to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so if we have to do that with God, we need to be able to do that with our spouse. So a person that gets it says the same thing about it. This was horrible. This was awful. This was destructive. This was... This wasn't just a fling. This was unfaithfulness. This was betrayal. This it was wasn't a mistake. It was, yes. it was, yeah. Yeah. So they call it for what it is. That's part of getting it. Another part of getting it is to grasp the depth of the injuries. A lot of times when people first get discovered, they're so caught up in the shame of the exposure that they get distracted from looking at their partner's pain. They're caught up in their own pain. And so 
again, if they don't get the partner's pain and injuries, the depth of it, the trauma, the grief, um, what it, they can just, if they can learn to do their best to understand what it's like to be in their spouse's shoes, that goes a long way toward getting it. I have a lot of spouses that complain to me. He or she doesn't get it because they're still a little bit in la-la land or they minimize. And minimizing is one of the worst things you can do. Yeah, and that's what I want to talk about next is just what are some of the challenges and obstacles to getting it? Because as you're saying that, Linda, I'm thinking, well, listen, the the fundamental paradigm of somebody who is breaking that covenant by having an affair is a paradigm of self-centeredness, self-focus. So when you're saying that getting it include is requires that that person be able to understand their spouse's pain, isn't that an obstacle? Just the the selfishness, the self-absorption of the person who had an affair. How do, how does somebody break through that obstacle? And maybe what are some other obstacles that the unfaithful partner has in getting it? I love that. Um, part of it is coming clean right away. Uh, not parsing it out, not dribbling out the truth. The sooner they get out the truth and answer their spouse's questions. Now, I understand CSATs have a lot more structured way of coming to disclosure, but in my work with, if, if there is such a thing as garden variety and fidelity, I've just found that they just need, I mean, the couples that go into crisis, they're staying up half the night, she's drilling him with questions, or he's asking a million questions. And just to not be evasive and answer. And as the light comes on, they start to get it uh, because they have to face. They have to face the damage. I had a guy that was just convinced that if his wife ever found out about his affair, he was going to take off and leave with the affair partner. Well, I'll tell you when he, when she discovered it, she had a very appropriate self-respecting reaction, like screaming, crying throwing the phone on the floor. She she was angry and hurt. And as soon as he saw the degree of hurt on her face from the truth, it's like the bubble burst. And he wanted to save his marriage in the worst way. So some of it's just the light, is submitting yourself to the light, whether that's a therapist, pastor, um, I think accountability group, and then being honest about whatever your spouse asks of you that that helps pull out of the, uh, the bubble. Another thing is just being able to recognize that what you were in was a bubble because of the brain chemistry. Uh, mo a lot of people don't realize the degree of emotional distortion that they've been under. And as a result, they, um, they romanticize the affair or what they were involved in. So beginning to get some education about how this affected their brain chemistry, the dopamine, adrenaline, phenylethylamine, the oxytocin, and the fact that you can't, how would I say, imitate those that same high in a normal seasoned marriage. The more there are the barriers, the greater the high from the affair, because it's secret, it involves sneaking around, it raises those brain chemicals much higher than it can be in a normal, realistic relationship. So just recognizing that helps them to go, okay, this was unrealistic. I was in a bubble. This isn't real. I think another thing is beginning to recognize the rationalizations and admit them because we have to live with ourselves. There's a state of what we call cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. where at first, we know we're kind of violating our values or our relationship with the Lord, but over time, in order to feel better about what we're doing, we start rationalizing one step at a time, trying to explain, why did I fall in love with this outside person? Why did I get attracted to that person? And we rewrite the marital history to justify it. We blame mm -hmm. our spouse, anybody but ourselves. That'll get in the way of getting it. But as soon as we start calling those rationalizations for what they are, the lights, again, begin to turn on. Um, another thing is the tendency to compartmentalize. Uh, and this is especially true with people that uh, did that the affair was a long time ago and they've just put it away in a box. Those are some of my harder couples to work with because A, they can't recall the details and, and they, they're so out of tune with 
what those feelings were back then that they deny the depth and the deception uh, involved in it. So those are just a yeah. few things that get in the way. Yeah, and so much of what you're saying there, especially when you started mentioning about like the brain chemistry and things like that, I immediately thought that's part of having that well-advised approach to recovery, right? Because those are things that most people don't just naturally know about how all those chemicals work and, and how affairs really um, exacerbate those yes. chemical releases in the brain in a way that's even beyond, like you said, what would happen in a normal, healthy relationship. Well, so, along with that, I, I do want to add that it, it can put people in a kind of a temporary state of adolescence or even narcissism, even if they aren't maybe a narcissistic personality disordered person, but you get really self-consumed because it's like a drug. It mimics mm -hmm. the effect of morphine. And so you do almost anything to get to the high, to get to the drug. And so you become a person that you probably weren't before and hopefully after. But if you don't go through dismantling uh, the rationalizations, you kind of stay in that state of adolescence in a, in a sad way. Yeah. So, Linda, in the book, you, you outline these 15 essential steps that are, you know, necessary in order to repair and heal a marriage that's impacted by an affair. Now, we're not going to be able to tackle every single one of those, but I do want to mention the first one as a way of kind of launching into the next part of our conversation here. The first one you mentioned is that successful rebuilders tell their spouses the truth about the affair rather than waiting to be discovered. Now, this actually seems so obvious to me. I mean... It seems like one of those things like, well, of course, you need to tell the truth about the affair. Why do you feel the need to state something that seems so obvious as like the first step towards yeah. rebuilding? Well, my experience has been most people don't make that right. step of confessing and admitting it. They wait to be caught. They're, they're trying to they might break up umpteen times with the affair partner or they might think, well, I just won't get caught so I can sneak it around. And But it's they wait too long, and when they get caught, that's when the lights turn on. If they were just to volunteer it, there are a few instances where people do volunteer it because they just can't stand the the struggle going on and and all that or conviction of the Lord or that, just leave That was it my story. Out. I was, was I was I was suicidal, and so it was like I'm too lazy to write a note. I'm just going to say all this and then kill myself. Was basically kind of my, that's the state of mind I was in. So it wasn't like oh I want to confess this because it's so heavy and I want to do something about it. It was almost like <laughs> I'm I'm done. But there could be like you said, there's lots of reasons for why people. But you're right. I think that is the uncommon yes. way that people do it. They usually don't voluntarily give that information. I think I put it in the book just to know, number one, it's typical for it to be the other way. But if somebody's reading the book and they haven't been discovered yet, that it might be the thing that kicks them into being the one to volunteer the information. They will have a, that's the best first step if it's possible. Now, it doesn't mean it's hopeless if they're caught versus confessing, but I just wanted to encourage some that may be reading the book that... If you confess first, that's going to be a really great first step. And how do you think, do you think there is maybe something even underneath that that is really important about just learning to initiate uh, with maybe doing difficult things? Because isn't that part of what the rebuilding process is going to be like? Yes. Well, a lot of people that have an outside relationship or addiction are not very good at dealing with conflict. They're mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And it's one of the predictors of a marriage being vulnerable to some crisis like this, if they're not dealing with their real feelings and they're afraid. So that can just be an extension of that. Um, yeah, yeah. They're afraid of discovery, afraid of exposure, afraid of having to deal with the discomfort of anger or hurt. And the process, that's why I love doing this work because in the process of having to do the worst thing possible which is deal with infidelity and that recovery process they actually learn how to deal with conflict they actually learn they don't die if they mm -hmm. tell the truth and if they share their real feelings that that it actually is a hump i cannot tell you how many times i've i had a couple recently they were seeking me for counseling and he was just sure he couldn't get over his wife's affairs a number of years ago 
and um, but he knew she was holding secrets. And when she finally confessed and admitted the last secret, she thought, this is going to end it. I, I've held off because I just knew this would be too much for him. Well, uh, I told, I warned her. I said, please tell the truth. It's going to get worse before it gets better. But afterwards, it'll get better. Mm -hmm. And um, she admitted it to him and she was scared to death. And uh, yes, he was flipping mad um, because the trigger was somewhere like near their home. And so... But you know what? A week later, he came home from work weeping and pulled her into his arms and said, you're my best friend. Mm. I don't want to lose you. And it was getting that last secret that broke them through the barrier of being on the way to really recovering. So what we think is going to destroy, it actually brings you closer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's what we, that's what I want to talk about next, because, you know, lying and hiding are so central, right, to to perpetuating an affair. I mean, that is really what I, we tell guys all the time. Listen, the way that you the way that your secret stays a secret is you lie and you hide. So what advice do you give for helping the unfaithful spouse to break free from their history of lying and hiding? That's, no, that's a really good question. I think just looking at where that started, because it probably started in their childhood somewhere, hiding from parents, hiding from peers, um, that imposter syndrome, if somebody knew who I really was, they wouldn't like me. I mean, there's some deeper issues there, usually behind lying and hiding. I think just trusting that the light is healing rather than destroying. The light heals when it's done fairly and honestly, and I try to just build up their confidence that it's better to be upfront and honest and just kind of come clean than it is to keep hiding. There is an energy behind hiding and secrecy, which keeps the adrenaline going, but it it's not ultimately satisfying. Um, it's an energy that exhausts you at some point, right? <laughs> yes, yes, so that's then, true. So and I imagine you go what? ahead. I was going to say, I imagine you've gotten a lot of this question then from the faithful spouse of saying, OK, so the secrets have come out. I've been lied to for however long. And I'm, I'm recognizing what those lies were and how on earth am I going to be able to tell if this person who's been lying to me for however long is now telling the truth? That's got to be a fearful thing for the faithful spouse. What kind of advice or help do you give to the faithful spouse to be able to determine whether or not something is actually true or whether or not this person is being honest with them now? Very good question. That's one of the biggest challenges, actually, of my work is to try and balance that out. Um, and you don't want them believing someone that is still lying. Mm -hmm. So um, I encourage them, first off, the spouses are often usually really surprised but they're because it's because they're giving the benefit of the doubt. They may have had little inklings that something was off or that their spouse was disengaging and they didn't understand why. So I try to take them back to their intuition. There's, there's a book, and I can't remember the title of it. It was written by a policeman. And he said, a woman's best protection is trusting her instincts, trusting her intuition in terms of her protection against crime. And so I try to help spouses get in tune with what did you overlook, not to blame you because you were right. believing the best, but where where what did your intuition, now that you look back, where was it telling you the truth? And I try and teach them to trust that. That's one thing. Another thing is it's okay to have boundaries. In fact, they need to. And if their spouse isn't imposing their boundaries on themselves, like here's the password to my... Um, email, here's my password to my phone, I don't have any secret Facebook or Instagram accounts. Um, so there's this complete openness and the spouse needs to not feel guilty for asking for those things. Um, and so if the betrayer can just be an open book, it helps a ton. But for the spouse that was betrayed not to feel guilty asking for those things. Mm -hmm. I think that helps. Excuse me, I'm I'm getting a little That's okay. tickle. <coughs> um, the other thing is, 
is um, you, you gain trust when you feel like your spouse is being honest with other people. So if they're in an accountability group, if they are seeing a, a specialist of some kind, whether it's a CSET or infidelity specialist, there's that extra protection. The other thing is that they're really pursuing a relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. There's something about the Holy Spirit conviction that they've insulated themselves from and to to be humble and just broken before God. Uh, that's an extra source of comfort for the betrayed spouse. Again, it's scary. It's that trust but verified. They should be able to ask questions. They shouldn't be shamed for saying, how come you were so late or can I put a locator on my phone? Just, uh, when you have to travel for business, because that's where this happened, that you're gonna you're gonna call me, you're gonna take a picture of the room. Um, it's just that those things a lot repeated over and over again seem seem to help. I had one guy who <laughs> he he had had an affair with somebody in his office, and usually I tell people you pretty much have to leave that job. Uh, you have to be in a totally different you know building or leave the job entirely. I had one guy poo-pooing me about that. Um, and uh, after a year of trauma and struggles, he finally left the job and things really, really got better in his relationship. Mm -hmm. But I had one guy that was gonna retire in three months. So he put a timer on his watch and it and it and when it went off, it would be like at five o'clock just after he'd gotten home. He'd sit down with his wife and he would tell her every detail of the day, every potential um, crossing of paths with the other woman, what was said, what wasn't said. He went over it in detail for the next three months. And that's how she was able to live with him still being in mm -hmm. the job for that short time. So well, that and, and that makes me think of the next question I have for you, because you say in the book that successful rebuilders accept full responsibility for their actions. And, and I think that gal you mentioned that was retiring in three months, because I was going to ask you, what does that look like practically? Yeah. I think that's one thing that he was saying, I'm taking full responsibility here. Listen, I, I'm going to be in this situation for three months, but I'm not going to be living under a rock. I'm not going to be hiding or being deceptive or deceitful about what's going on. What are some right. other ways that that taking full responsibility, what does that look like practically? Yeah, no, those, those are good. One is 100% break off with the other person. Uh, that shows that they are taking responsibility. They're not, not making excuses. And this is just sort of a side note, but never say anything nice about the other person. Oh, she was really lonely, or she needed my help, or he really needed someone to confide in, or oh, he was hot. That was all part of the affair bubble, so mm -hmm. just don't do that. Part of taking responsibility, personal responsibility, is not putting it off on anybody else. Uh, she or he came on to me and I couldn't help myself or or you were being this or that you're you gained weight you weren't very fun anymore you you know weren't meeting my needs you aren't a good listener all, all the excuses in the world uh, are the opposite of taking personal responsibility so if your spouse feels blamed that's so unfair it doesn't mean that your spouse is perfect nobody's married to a perfect person but to blame your choice to step out of the marriage in some way was 100% you. Your spouse did not hold a gun to your head and say, go have sex with your secretary. You right, know, they right. didn't do that. They didn't make you do that. So you say, I did this. I made the choice. I didn't have to. And I am now going to take full responsibility for my behavior here on out. Um, another way of taking full responsibility is to explore the deeper issues. What was going on? Was I in deep grief and just looked at this as an antidepressant of sorts? Mm -hmm. uh, did I have exposure to pornography when I was young and it became a habit and it just grew? Was I uh, trained to be this way because of my family of origin? Was there modeling in my family that uh, had an unconscious effect on me and made me have permission? You know, in counseling, when somebody's suicidal, if they've had a relative a particularly a close relative that saw that as a way out, that is so permission giving, they are more likely and more in, uh, to actually take action on it than a person that didn't have that in their family. Same is true with infidelity. If they had a, you know, so they have to deal with their own hurts and anger 
and feelings of betrayal. Um, and so they look at any abuse, you know, any trauma that's just unresolved, and this is how they were trying to resolve it. And so they taking full responsibility is a part of just looking at themselves and exploring the deeper issues. Um, and then the other thing is the whole frequent check-ins thing. I can't emphasize that enough. That is, again, saying, this is on my spouse's mind 24-7. I am not going to just pretend that this didn't happen or ignore it or just talk to them once a week. At the beginning, it has to be every day, maybe even several times a day, that sort of thing. Um, that makes a difference. Do you have any tips for how to do that well? Because I've, you know, dealing with many, many couples over the years, you know, you have some betrayed spouses that are like, I need every detail. You have others that are like, hey, you're in your group, you're doing your thing. I need maybe summaries, <laughs> you know, what are some tips that you have for what those check-ins look like? What, what needs to be uh, part of that? What maybe doesn't need to be part of that and how to do that in a healthy way? Because this leads into my next question about how do you begin to rebuild trust? I mean, that's a huge yeah. issue, right? In terms sure. of when that trust has been broken. So how can these check-ins actually help? How can we do them well? And then how can they actually help rebuild trust? Good question. I think the check-ins are mostly about how you doing today. You know, did you, did anything happen that brought up a trigger? What were your triggers today? Um, just checking in to see how your spouse is doing instead of going, well, things seem to be okay right now, so I'm not going to upset the apple cart because that's the fear. Oh, if we start talking about this, they're going to go down into the dungeon and we're going to just end up in a three-hour conversation. To just know that if they initiate a check-in, that it actually drops the spouse's feeling of isolation. There's a saying that goes, a burden shared is a burden halved. Your spouse the spouse is in constant torment. And so when the partner that was betraying shows interest and care and concern, it just, it's like lifting a burden off of their shoulders that they get to share it. So I think that's where the check-in thing is most important. Okay. What, what are some of the core beliefs that need to change in order to heal and rebuild? And on both sides, the core beliefs maybe of the betraying spouse, as well as maybe some of the core beliefs of the faithful spouse, yeah. what needs to change in order for, there to rebuild, for them to rebuild? Good question. Um, I think that the betraying spouse just has to recognize their rationalizations. That's, that's part of it. I think coming into a process of genuine repentance, when you asked earlier about how do you rebuild trust, genuine repentance is hard to fake. Um, mm. Because you can use words, but I always tell spouses, look at your partner's actions. How are they behaving? Are they acting like they've their issues are their private business? Or are they saying, hey, I'm an open book? Are they remorseful? Uh, do they make amends just like Zacchaeus you know he wasn't just gonna repay everybody what he owed them but he was gonna pay him more uh, so being willing to do that is a trust building thing hey I bought her you know a, a diamond necklace for her, her birthday well doggone it I'm gonna get you a better one or you can pick what you would like to have I mean uh, getting uh, rid of triggers uh, just the repentant attitude, remorse, humility, not acting like, how do I say it? It's, there's just an arrogance that sometimes just gets in the way of the spouse being able to trust. And so genuine repentance, empathy, showing eagerness to do repair instead of like, uh, you're pulling my chain. I don't, you know, I'm, how come you're not over this by now? This is why are you bringing this up now? None of that. There's yeah. just a, 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 an openness to to doing that. Um, what was your next question? It was well, about I, was, I, I think this is going to lead into where, because where you kind of in the book, and, and I, I'm going to leverage what you said about just the the difference between sort of just your just your words and actual true repentance. And so I think that leads into where you go in the book at the end about the idea that this is more about character transformation in the betraying spouse than it is about just trying to put some fires out, you know, uh, pretty things up, make 
make some, you know, uh, superficial amends in order to just keep rolling forward in life. So yeah. can you talk about how important it is that the betraying spouse get on a personal mission of character change rather than just trying to, as quickly as possible, make yeah. everything quote unquote better? Um, yes. I think character change involves that humility thing that I talked about. It also is just a willingness to do whatever it takes uh, and instead of avoid and and to welcome the feedback rather than resist it to say I'm gonna be a person of integrity determined to be a person of integrity rather than an avoider um, uh, I'd say one of the practical things I, I had someone do this recently they they wrote letters of apology to their spouses mm. relatives Wow. Uh, because they knew that they were going to have to be seeing them, and there's always was always this icy feeling, and he just wrote the nicest letter. He just said, "Look, I have really injured my wife, and I don't blame you for wanting to defend her, or, you know, sympathize with her and be cautious about me. I just want you to know I am sincere about my efforts. I really love her, and I really am sorry for the injuries I have caused your sister, your daughter." whatever mm -hmm. and he just laid it out in a beautiful way that's character change yeah um, it's um being humble enough to say i i can't figure this out myself it's i'm mm -hmm. gonna get help um and another thing that i missed earlier is the whole idea of anticipating i'm going back to a practical thing is if you anticipate your spouse's Triggers like, for example, if there's a movie on that involves adultery, you know, watching some movie like that, which it comes up a lot on TV, you reach over and hold your spouse's hand and say, are you doing okay? Do you need me to change the channel? So there's sort of an awareness, I suppose, in the character change that happens that says, I'm going to anticipate. I'm not just going to try and, you know, not rock the boat, but I'm going to recognize my spouse may be in a lot of pain right here. Well, that's that empathy piece you talked about earlier too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the idea of am I, am I being aware not just of my own feelings and and you know environment, but am I being aware of what my spouse is feeling and experiencing? Anything else that you would like to share with just a couple out there that's maybe they're just maybe they're on the front end of this or maybe they're trying to figure this out? Um, what would you want to say to them just to as a word of encouragement? I kind of look at, I, I, I mean, a break in the marital commitment is huge. It's it's like a compound fracture. And too often we don't have the confidence that if it's set right with a lot of support around it, that it'll actually become more strengthened the, in the place of the break than it is anywhere else along the bone. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people look, get this set right. Do it in the beginning instead of having to re-break it and go. I had a gal come in that her hand had been repaired supposedly by a surgeon and it wasn't repaired right. And no doctor wanted to take it on because they didn't want to contradict the other doctor. And and so she had to have that rebroken. But when it was set right with a lot of support, she doesn't have any pain in that hand anymore. Wow. And I, I just believe that we are meant to heal and that God wants to do that but we've got to get the support and the right things put in the right place for that to happen yeah well Linda this has been a phenomenal conversation uh, where can people go to get the book and just maybe some more resources that you have for couples who are in this situation thanks uh, well Amazon carries my book there are a few people that have kind of copied my title but um, just look for my name and then you'll get the right book. My website is uh, lindajmcdonald.com and it's M-A-C. And I put my middle initial in there because there's a lot of McDonald's out there. So that would be probably the best place. I've got blogs, I've got articles, I've got webinars, uh, book recommendations. So I, I would welcome anyone to visit the website. 
Yeah. We'll be sure to put all of that in our show notes and, and we'll link to the correct book on Amazon okay. so that everybody can just go straight to it. But thank you sure. so much. Thank you for doing this work because this is hard work. It's messy work. Um, we don't always get to see the outcomes that we hope for, but it's so delightful when we get to see restoration happen, right? And so thank you for doing this work and for just being part of this conversation today. Well, thank you. And I've heard about Be Broken forever. Um, so it's really nice to actually meet you in person, Jonathan. And uh, I really believe in your ministry, so I'm happy to have been a part of this conversation. Well, thanks. Well, listeners, we're always glad that you're with us. Please check out the show notes so you can get all those links and all those other resources. And if there's anything else that we can do to come alongside you and help you in your journey from brokenness to wholeness, please reach out to us. We'll see you here next time. Take care.